Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to this talk about observability-driven development. Uh, but before we start, let me quickly introduce myself. Um, my name is Geert van der Kruijze. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands. That's why my name is so unpronounceable for anyone not from the Netherlands. Um, in the Netherlands, I work as a uh, consultant at a company called Xperit. And what I basically do is um, I help software teams build better software. And I do this in different ways. Uh, fulfilling different roles within teams. I often come there as a cloud native architect, helping teams uh, make use of the cloud. Uh, I go in as a DevOps coach, helping to improve their development processes. And I would like to call myself a full cycle developer, which means I like to build software from initial idea to actually running it on production and keeping it running there. So. Before we start with observability, I would like to make a confession to you, um, which is I test on production. And I mean, yeah, this might sound a little bit scary. And as I said, I'm a consultant, so I go into, well, uh, different software teams at clients, and I test on production at those clients as well. Um, although this might sound scary, um, I'm not like that guy, right? I'm when I say I test in production, it doesn't mean I only test in production, right? I think testing in production is a really valuable thing that we should do as developers in our tool set next to all the testing that we already do, right? You still you should do unit tests and all the other kinds of tests, but being able to test in production is also a very val valuable um, thing to have. And, well, during this session I would like to uh, discuss with you uh, to see if you could start doing testing in production as well. Or maybe you are already testing in production. And I think you are, or if you're not, probably then your end users are testing in production. So my main key takeaway is um, stop being afraid of your uh, production environment, right? It's something that we learned as an industry, like at developers, we go everywhere except production, and production is for our IT operations, right? Um, assuming everyone here is a developer who's not a developer, right? Everyone is a developer, right? And I have some questions. Who of you has access to their production environment? Well, quite some. That's, that's nice. Um, some other questions. I see everyone doing Agile or DevOps. Who of you is in, in a Agile or DevOps company? Right, yeah, also almost everyone. It's, it's the thing we do um, in the industry right now. Everyone's doing some form or Agile or, or doing DevOps stuff. And when I visit my, uh, my customer, I really see a lot of, well, the same mistakes being made over and over again. And one of them is, well, we're doing Agile because, well, we're a lot faster. We want to go to production faster. We, we want to push out our features faster, right? That's, that's the promise that, um, th that we promise our management. Um, but going fast is not valuable if you're not going in the right direction, right? We want to deliver real value to, uh, to our customers and that value has to be valuable for customers. Otherwise, if you build features that no one's using, that's not value, right? We can't push th those features really fast, but if they are no value to the customers, then why are we doing this? And to be able to know that we're actually building the right stuff for our customers, we need to test in production. Um, there's some forms of testing in production. Uh, testing how your users are behaving in production, doing A-B testing, uh, doing experiments in production. We really need to have access to production to be able to do these kinds of things. I think A-B testing is really something that's, that's really important to build the right features. I was once at a client that was a big uh, insurance company and they said, well, we need to have this mobile app because in the mobile app then they can do everything for their insurances. They can uh, create new insurances, change all the nitty-gritty details. We will need to create a, a mobile app for that. It will cost about half a million, and that's a great idea. And we're like, are users really 
want to do these things from a mobile phone, I think mobile apps are, should be focused on really specific uh, small tasks, not filling out large forms. So, well, we had a discussion uh, at the business owner, the product owner, and um, and we as a development team. And what we what we did is we just created a banner like we're building this app. Download it now or get more information now. So we we put that banner on the website and just started measuring how many people actually click that banner to get more information about the app or or trying uh, people trying to download that app. And what we noticed after a month of having that banner on uh, on their main website, almost nobody clicked on it. So that was proof that our users weren't actually waiting on this feature. Uh, these kind of small experiments are simple to do, and you're not wasting half a million to build an app that no one's using. Uh, and another really nice example about A-B testing is uh, maybe you heard about it from, uh, from Google. Well, uh, they have a big uh, uh, the search engine, and when you search, you get all these results, and you can click on uh, the search results, which are like blue lines. One of the UX designers at Google said, well, if we actually change that color blue, we could actually increase the number of clicks on our results. And he came up with a nice color blue, and he said, well, we need to change it to this color blue. So he proposed that to the product owner at Google, and the product owner said, well, how do you know this is the right color blue? So instead of just assuming that the, the UX uh, expert was an expert in his area. What they did is they deployed 50 different colors of blue to uh, to their production environment, and it would distribute them e evenly over all the uh, the users. And then they start measuring which blue actually worked the best, right? And there was quite some difference in the color blue and how users react to this. Um, and yeah, you could just think of what what blue is the best, but actually measuring it gives you the real information, and uh, you can work with data instead of just uh, guesses. But we can only do this in production. So going fast, uh, really deploying really fast and getting our features out the door really fast is a good thing, but sometimes we have to slow down a bit and think about our actions before we uh, commit to doing certain changes. And that's what Agile and DevOps is far more about instead of just going fast. What I like about um, when you look at DevOps, Donovan Brown has a really good uh, uh, explanation on, on what DevOps is. Uh, DevOps is the union of people, processes, and products to enable continuous delivery of value. Uh, value is the keyword here. We want to deliver <coughs> value to our customers, which is actual value, so useful features. But value is only real value to a customer when it's running in production and when it's not breaking down, right? When we have our features and we deploy it to our production environment, it's only value when it keeps on running and, uh, and can win the races in th this example, right? So to be able to check that, we also need to test in production. We can do this in, in several different ways. Um, doing canary releasing, right? Creating small releases where we deploy a feature to a small set and see what happens. Doing ring-based deployments, so uh, we expose our features initially to a really small group of users and then expose it to more and more users over time uh, to be able to see the impact. When you think about multi-region deployments, how are we testing this up front? Can we test all these? How do we have like all different regions in our staging environment? That's, that's really hard to do, right? So we can only test these deployments actually in production. When you want to do chaos engineering, uh, inserting small experiments where you break stuff to see if your ap application is being able to cope with this is often only possible in production because, well, staging is never the same as your production environment. And if you want to do um, refactoring of really complex calculation models or those kinds of things, um, shadow testing might be really useful where you have your or original algorithm, you deploy a next one next to it um, at the new implementation, and you just start running them simultaneously. You s keep using the old one, but you run the, the new one in parallel and just compare the outcome. Uh, you can do your test yourself uh, with your test team and, and check for a number of outcomes, but that's, well, 
only a limited amount of time that you have. But if you expose this to all the users you have, um, without really exposing it, because you're still using the old one, um, you can really test if this new implementation is working correctly. And we can really use the, the power that we have in production because we have real data and real users. But uh, when I say these things to my customers, they often say, well, we have a staging environment, right? We can do most things there. But staging has, a, uh, yeah, has some, some downfalls. Um, does your staging environment have has real, real data? Does it have real users? Well, most of the time it doesn't, or we spend an um, enormous time amount of time to actually um, create this data or extract it from production, anonymize it, all those kinds of things, which really, really take a lot of effort. And I think you should rather spend your time um, doing stuff towards production because that's where your value is. Your value is not on staging. As developers, we only have a limited amount of time, right? And if we spend that time on staging, well, it's basically wasted time. So I think we can agree that testing on production is important. And the key to actually being able to do this in production is observability. So that's the link back to my talk. So observability um, comes from uh, the control theory, and this is the official um, well, description from Wikipedia. Uh, observability is a measure of how well internal states of a system can be inferred from knowledge of its external outputs. <coughs> Which means, when we have a system, we want to be able to query it on how it's performing without changing the system itself. We want to keep the, the system running in production, and then we want to be able to query what is going uh, correctly and what's going wrong. So when you often say this to IT operations teams, like, well, we already have monitoring, right? So what's the big difference in observability and uh, monitoring? Well, the basic thing is that monitoring is focusing on known unknowns. And what this means is that you have a, uh, a certain amount of things that you know can go wrong, right? For example, you're running on a server, and when the disk is full, well, the, the, your application might crash, right? So you, you start monitoring the disk usage of your server, uh, which is a known unknown. You, you know that the disk might be full, you, only, you don't know when this will happen. So you start monitoring for that. And what observability is trying to do is create a system that you can get query for, you don't know what will go wrong, you don't know when it will go wrong, but when stuff is, is going wrong, you want to be able to query what is actually going wrong. And uh, I like this quote that when you do monitoring, you're building dashboards, each dashboard is actually um, only checking for past problems, right? If you have a problem in the past, you create a dashboard for it, and uh, yeah, then you're looking for that problem, but there are so many problems that can occur in your application. And we're building more and more complex applications, right? We're, we're doing microservices, we're doing cloud, we're doing distributed systems. Um, I like these two architecture diagrams, or well, diagrams uh, uh, looks like the Death Star, but the, le the left one is actually the Amazon.com webshop. So it's only webshop, it's not uh, AWS or anything, it's only their webshop running with all the microservices in it. And on the right, we have Netflix. So, well, these are big microservices shops, and these architectures are, well, un understandable by humans, right? We can't use these diagrams anymore because they have just so many instances, so many uh, microservices that it's, yeah, we can't comprehend with this. So we have to look at these applications from a different kind of view. Um, we have to make a mindset shift that if we build really complex systems in the cloud with so many components, our application will never be fully up. It will never be that all the, all the different components in your application will always be up. Maybe, have, uh, maybe you're doing deployments, so one of the different nodes is, uh, is going down. Uh, there can be so many things happening to your application that it will always be in a state that something is not working correctly. And therefore, traditional monitoring tools don't really work, right? If we just check for 
uptime of certain servers and those kinds of things, that, that doesn't work anymore. So we have to make a shift here. And the shift is that we should start measuring the impact of our users. We don't care about how our system is doing, we care about how our users are interacting with the system, because that's where, where it's all about, right? It's about value for our customers. And, well, again, Netflix, uh, they have this really um, complex scenario. They, they are really good at uh, measuring this user impact. So what Netflix does, and uh, they have some really good blog, blog posts about it, it's um, they measure what they call the pulse of Netflix. And what it is, is that, that they actually they measure the amount of play button clicks by every users all over the world. And well, they have millions of users, so it's for them it's really easy to, uh, to define certain patterns and expectations of how many people will watch at a certain moment. But what they do is, when a normal user uh, starts playing Netflix, he will just go into the library, click play, and the, the stream will start playing, right? If they see a, a highly increase in the amount of play clicks, it means there's probably something wrong with the streaming server that's starting those streams because, well, people keep pressing play, right? If, if everything was working correctly, they would press play once and then sit back and relax. And the other thing around, uh, if you look at the other side, if people are uh, pressing play less and less, there might be something else wrong. People are not able to actually see the library of uh, movies to, uh, to stream or they don't see the, uh, the play button to actually click on it. So uh, there might be problems in, in the front end showing stuff. So these are just indicators of stuff going wrong and users being impacted. Yeah, so we want to build an application that's, that we can measure and, and check that our users are not being impacted. And yeah, we want to build resilient systems that can handle all kinds of errors when, um, uh, uh, when we build applications for our users. And there are several ways to, to check on this. Uh, um, when I often hear people, okay, we're go just going to check if our application is available, right? So we just measure the amount of uh, 200 OKs on all the requests. If everything is 200 OK, our application is working fine. But it doesn't have to mean your application is actually working fine. If you look at, take a look at an example of a search service, um, I might be able to access the search service, enter a query, and it's never returning any results because, well, the underlying uh, search API or whatever is not working. So yeah, I get a 200 OK, no results found. Uh, so yeah, it might seem that my application is working, but for the end user, it's not, right? So we have to take into account other factors as well, such as the correctness of the data or the freshness, right? If we take a look at a, a website and the underlying database that should supply the data is unavailable, it might be that we pull the data from a cache and we are still able to show certain amounts of data to our users. But the longer the database is actually down and we're showing cache data, the less valuable this page is for our users. So. Right. Taking into account all these different things uh, that impact users is really important. And when we're building an application, we should also, also make, make a mindset shift there that if things go wrong, we fail in an open way. And I'm going to use Netflix again as an example because I think Netflix as, as a company has really, really thought through about all this uh, creating an application that's, that's really good for users, although the user experience is really shitty, but that's, that's a different part. Right? Their availability is really good. And what they do is they have some really good examples of how to fail in an open way. Let me, let me tell you about this example. Um, authentication service, right? Almost all applications have an authentication server. Just at the beginning of when you're using your application, you have to authenticate, log in, and then you can use your application. What happens when authentication server is down? Well, we can't use our application anymore, right? What Netflix did is, how can we make sure that we impact our users at least as possible when our authentication server is down? What they do is, they will just show you, show everyone all the, li the, the full library of all the movies and all the series uh, without logging you in. Because if authentication server is down, 
it's their problem. Right? And they say, well, we want to impact uh, the least amount of impact for our users, so we will just show all the stuff to everyone until we get our problems fixed. And uh, users are not being bothered with the authentication service being down because they can still just watch their movie. And these kind of thoughts when you're building your application are really important, keeping your end user in mind when building your application. I think we do that as an industry, f well, not enough. We, we should do that more and more often. And well, authentication server, uh, for Netflix, it's easy to open it when you're building a bank application. Uh, please don't, do not use this example. Uh, we, uh, sometimes you really need to have the user, but in some cases, uh, you might not. Or there are other, other stuff that you could use to, uh, to fill open. And when we're building the software, I think software ownership is really uh, an, a key aspect. When we want to build software, as a development team, we want to take ownership of building the application from initial idea to having it in production. Because I think, as developers, we are the only people who know what the application is doing and what might go wrong. So giving this to uh, IT operations is really not the best solution. And I think observability can really help us in enabling, this, uh, enabling us to, uh, to take this ownership. When you look at DevOps, I think in general, when you look at the past few years, what happened in the industry is when you look at all the changes that happened because of DevOps is basically we teach all our operations people to become devs, right? We, we told them to put all the scripts in source control, to uh, do infrastructure as code, to automate all the deployments, all those kinds of things. And I think we're, we're past that, right? Uh, everyone has that. Currently, uh, uh, it's just bec it became an industry standard. Um, but I think now it's the time that we actually, as developers, um, step in and take control as well. I think it's time to uh, really close the DevOps cycle and, as devs, get production access. Because when something goes wrong and we take ownership, then um, we need production access to actually fix the stuff that went wrong. Um, but having more permissions also comes with some consequences, right? Because if we take this ownership, it also means that we need to uh, have on-call. So who of you has to do on-call sometimes? Hmm. Only a few of you. Well, uh, I think that's, that's weird, right? Uh, everyone wants, who wants production access, right? Everyone wants it. Uh, or, well, <coughs> quite some people already had it, so which is good, but then you're probably not using it when you're not on call. So I think uh, we want to take the responsibility, uh, get more access, but then we also uh, have to do on call. And looking at the DevOps cycle, everyone always draws it as an affinity sign. But there are very few companies that actually have this full loop implemented. I Almost at every company where I go, I see that from operation and monitoring, it stops, right? From I don't see um, stuff flowing back to actually uh, changing our application based on the stuff that runs in production. And that's something I would like to try to change with this session. And the main problem is that we still have IT operations which have their own KPIs, um, and we have business and developers who together have their own AP uh, KPIs. Uh, often, IT operations only have KPIs that's, that go into, well, please keep this application up and running 100% of the time. And when that's your KPI, you want to have as least change as possible, right? Because, well, change is not good for your KPIs. Well, business and developers, they are a really different kind. They want to have business agility. They want to be able to push new features um, out as fast as possible. So while these teams are really in conflict, they are all working for the same companies, right? So if you look at the higher level KPIs, they all together want to improve their company, improve, improve their application, right? That's 
what they're working on together. So I think we should really merge these kind of teams into, well, I just call them development teams. And there might be some people who are more experienced in the operations side and some people are, who are more into uh, only development. But in the end, I think we should take a shared responsibility and uh, taking that ownership of the application. And as I said, observability is really key in this because when we have this, this, this insight into how our application is doing in production, we can connect this back to the business. So is the feature doing what we were ex uh, expecting it to do? And um, on a business side, so is it delivering the features to our users and are our users enjoying it the way we, uh, w the way we thought it would do? And on the other side, we're also connecting it to uh, operations so uh, we know how our, uh, our application is doing in production. And we look at observability, there's a, uh, quite some vendors currently, it's, a, it's really observability is, is quite a hype. So you see a lot of new vendors jumping into, um, into the observability space and they often f focus on, well, on the three pillars of observability or on one of the specific pillars. So if you look at the pillars of observability, it's logs, metrics, and traces. And these might be really different things or quite the same things, depending on the different vendors that you ask. Some vendors say, well, we have a solution that does all three of them. And some vendors say, well, these things are so different that we only do traces. So yeah, it's, um, it's quite hard. And in, in this talk, I don't want to focus too much on the tools or not at focus at the tools at all because it really depends on, on your team, on your application that you're building, the amount of users, the amount of traffic that you have, which tools fit you the best. So I have a list somewhere with, with a bunch of them, but when you go into this space, I think about logs, met, uh, metrics, and traces, and we'll go into a bit more detail about them. First thing is logging, right? Logging is something that we, well, almost everyone does, right? Or, or everyone does that. But who of you uses a, a central logging system? Okay, o almost half. That's, that's a good thing. Um, logging is really simple, right? It's just a one line of code and we will write some logging to somewhere, either a file or a central system. Um, so it's really easy to generate those logs but it's quite hard to get value out of these logs, eh? being able to query them. Um, and to make that a bit easier, um, we have to switch from just doing plain text logging to structured logging. And it's actually quite easy to do this. Um, and the difference is, when we're do just doing plain text logging, we will just write something uh, like request by user A to 35 milliseconds. Um, when we want to query this, it's really hard, right? We can just go through all our logs files and just um, uh, search for user A somewhere in the text. But sometimes uh, user A is also uh, some other stuff in, in other log messages. So what, what we would like to do with structured logging is create a log message where we actually expose certain objects and store these objects separately so we could later query on them. And how we could do this um, in, in the .NET space, there are several um, libraries to do this. I think Serilog is the uh, most used one, right? but you have application insights as well. Uh, you have nlog. So these are all ways to generate logs and generating logs is is easy um, and then we can send those logs somewhere to a central system and well there are so many suppliers that th these are just a, a handful of the um, uh, of the most used ones um, and some of these tools focus on uh, logs and metrics and traces some only on traces some on um, on, on metrics it really depends on on the type of tool so that's logging. And well, logging is really easy to do, but it's also really easy to generate a lot of logs. Right? I, I've been to companies where they had um, more data stored in their logs than actual business data. 
So they were uh, the, their logs were costing them more than their actual business data was was costing them. So we really have to think about how long do we want to store these kinds of logs and uh, what do we want to do with it? Can we? Yeah, there, there are solutions for this. Like uh, the simple solution is just um, reducing your retention time, right? Um, going storing it not uh, a year but only a few days. Uh, that that's the easy solution. But then if you want to go back, it's it's harder to do. The other the other solution that you could take is um, sampling your data, which means we will just store, for example, ten percent of all our all our log messages. Um, uh, this might might sound scary at first because, well, uh, when we're trying to search certain things, it, it might not be there. Um, so doing sampling, um, what I would like to advise is really think about what kind of logging am I doing? And I think there are two different kinds of, of logging in your system. Here you can do audit logs where you actually uh, try to store all the events that are happening in your application uh, from a bus business perspective, so you want to be able to trace back like, okay, who bought this product, when, etc. And you want to store those logs for a longer time, right? If you throw away half of those messages, your audit log is worthless. It's either fully complete or it's, it's, not, uh, it's not useful at all. But then when you're doing operational logging, I think sampling there uh, can be very useful. Um, when something is happening enough, you should be able to see it in your uh, in your log files, and otherwise uh, it really depends on how much you sample. But if you only store uh, a certain amount and it and the event is actually not showing up in the log files, is that bug then really important? Because it's only happening at uh, that small percentage of uh, your users. And a lot of these suppliers that that supply uh, central logging have solutions like uh, dynamic sampling, which means they, they will not just store a random percentage of your, um, of your log files. No, they will uh, pick a certain amount of the average calls, but they will especially also store all the outliers. So uh, those are more often the, the things that you actually want to query on. So going from logging to metrics, Metrics is actually often uh, aggregating these uh, uh, these kind of logs into time series and actually making them more valuable. And metrics are far easier to store because you actually aggregate some data, right? Instead of storing each request, we're just going to store uh, uh, the amount of requests in total for this minute or per second. So looking at the same example as that we, we did before, with uh, logging, from logging we can go into metrics and uh, change the log into a metric by saying, well, we had a 50 millisecond request. This is 50 millisecond higher than the average because we track all the average uh, uh, request times. And to metrics we could add a lot of dimension to uh, to query them a bit more, right? So we could say. Well, the request is slower than all the requests coming from Norway or on Mondays or uh, people who bought a certain product on your website. Right, these can be different indicators and might be useful to store or not. And adding all these features, uh, all these different factors to check on is called cardinality and these might make it a lot harder to actually store the amount of metrics that you would like to. From uh, metrics, we go to the third pillar, which is actually uh, distributed tracing. And it's best to explain this through an example. And that's like, okay, we know the request took 50 milliseconds, but why was that? Why did it take 50 milliseconds? And what you do with tracing, it you will just show all the stuff that happened during that call. So yeah, it called. It took 50 milliseconds because because we call a database that took 20 milliseconds, and we call this other service that took uh, 20 milliseconds as well. So together, uh, all the stuff that took 50 milliseconds. And there are uh, a lot of tools that focus on this as well. Uh, I think that distributed tracing is really a, a current hype in the in the microservices world because well, it's quite often hard to see uh, which services are calling which dependencies. Um, 
And using this distributed tracing, we can actually see the full application flow from, from front to back for a certain user or for a certain transaction. But as you can guess, um, distributed tracing, when you lock all these different dependencies and all the calls uh, between them, they, well, they are also quite uh, expensive to store, right? Because they will deliver a, a very high amount of, um, of data. And this is an example of, of Zipkin, which is uh, an open source tool that will actually give you this trace overview. So it's really useful when uh, searching for problems within your application to see, well, why does this call take so long or where, where did it actually go wrong? So uh, we, we learned about the three different things to, to measure. How do, can we actually measure this? Um, and as a, uh, a simple rule to, uh, for you to help what you should measure, and it's called use and read. So let me quickly explain what use is about. Use is a uh, measurements on a resource scope, so on a certain service or API or component of your application, you want to track the utilization, saturation, and error rate. So utilization is uh, how busy is my service actually? Saturation is how much work is waiting before my service will pick it up, right? So often measurements like this are, what's the average queue size? Uh, how many items are in the queue? Or even better is, how long does it average, uh, how long does it take for a item to be inserted in the queue and then be extracted in the queue again? On the other side, we have red, which is rate, errors and duration, but then on a request scope. Right? So for each request, we want to see the rate of this type of request per minute or per second. We want to see the errors of this type of request, right? how often is this request uh, correctly or how often is it going wrong. And we want to track the duration of these requests. And next to these basic things, there's also some other examples like feature flags. Um, who of you uses feature flags? Ah, a handful. That's, that's I think feature flags are really, again, useful when we want to take control of this production environment because this gives us the possibility to change stuff on production as developers, right? We can enable features or disable them again. And logging them is also really important. And when you log them, you can actually create very useful insights on how your feature flag is being used. Uh, take a look at this example, which is a, a graph that I drew myself from what a feature flag log, uh, log could look like. Um, so initially, we're deploying a feature and we're turning it on for a small amount of users, right? For example, we're doing ring-based deployments. We have three uh, rings, so we're deploying it to our first ring, our in, uh, internal beta testers, and they're going to test this feature. And then we find some bugs, so we disable um, uh, the feature flag again. Well, we fix the bug, we deploy a new version to production, and we enable it again, right? For the same users, and they will test it, and they see, well, okay, um, seems the bug is fixed, so we can roll out to more and more users. And so we roll it out to more users and uh, our third ring. Uh, in the end, everyone is using the feature flag. When everyone is using the feature flag, it's actually your feature flag turned into technical depth, right? It's something that needs to be cleaned up. So in this example, after everyone is using the feature flag, we drop off to a point where nobody's using the feature flag anymore, right? Because that's what we would like to do with feature flags. We would like to remove them after they're not useful anymore. What you could do with um, uh, your observability and, and creating alerts is, are there still f feature flags active that are always taking 100% of the users but are still in my code? So you could actually um, alert or create dashboards that show you how many uh, technical depth from your uh, feature flags you actually have at a certain amount of time. Um, uh, very early in the beginning, I also explained about doing experiments in production. Um, there's a, a nice library on GitHub called The Scientist, 
and um, what this library does, it, it makes you makes it possible for you to do these kinds of experiments in a production environment. So what you could do is you could have two implementations of the same uh, same code, or well, different code doing should doing the same thing. Um, one is the old way and one is the new way. What you can say, you can create an experiment and then say, well, use the old way, but also execute the new way. And it will execute both in parallel. It will, in the end, return the old value back to your, uh, to your code, so your code will just uh, run as normal. But you can also log the outcome of the new algorithm. And these ways you can see in parallel through all of the users that you have, if your um, algorithm, the new way of implementing your algorithm is still working as it was supposed to. This can give you really, really good insights because tracking up, uh, uh, seeing if these complex algorithms are working correctly is, is really hard to do with the bunch of testers that you have instead of running it through thousands of users that you have daily. So uh, this gives us some insights in observability, but the talk was called observability uh, driven development, right? Um, so when we have observability, I think we can use these techniques as well to improve our process in building software. And I really like test-driven development. Who of you uses test-driven development? Yeah, qu quite some people. I think test-driven development really um, made software development more mature, right? Um, when you do test-driven development, um, you tend to write better code, so the, the code quality is a lot better. Um, and you know, you're only writing the stuff that you actually need in your application, right? Because if it's not in the test, then why should, why should you build it, right? Um, I think taking these examples from test-driven development, we can actually take into observability-driven development. Um, and so test-driven development only gives you feedback for your small loop of development, right? So I want to build this and I get, get feedback if I build it correctly. When I do observability-driven development, we take a step back and think, well, we have this feature that we would like to build, um, but what is the expected outcome of this feature? So together with the business, we define a certain outcome and this can be numbers, right? For example, I, I know a lot of websites that have a sort of sales funnel or a sign-up funnel where you have to go through this wizard with all kinds of pages. And when you start measuring this, you see quite some drop-off at certain pages because the UX, UX is shit or well, there might be some bugs. Um, if you start measuring these kinds of things and then say, well, let's improve page number three because there we have the highest drop-off of our users. You start measuring this. You set. You say. You create some outcomes. Okay, we're going to change this, and and not 40% of our users should drop off at page number three, but we should aim for 20%. And then you start building uh, your feature or trying to do some experiments. What what works the best, and then see in your me in your measurements how you're actually doing uh, towards your users, right? Because that's where the value is again. So the first thing it does is close this DevOps infinity loop, right? We want to get feedback from production back to the planning phase. So we actually see how our, our stuff is doing in production. But it also gives us insights of, is our application running as we thought it would do? And it can also help us um, when we're doing deployments more and more often, uh, to uh, again a, a ring-based deployments. If we deploy it to our first environment, to our initial set of users, if we see a lot of measurements like availability go down or the uh, request time is taking longer and longer compared to before the deployment, we can actually use this in our deployment pipeline and make decisions on this. Uh, for example, you have release gates in Azure DevOps that can just check for your measurements and make decisions on that if you should be allowed to deploy it to more users or not. And what I think as developers, we have to know better 
how our application is doing before we do deployments. How often do we do as developers uh, check our system, uh, all the measurements, when stuff is not going wrong? We hardly do this, right? I think we should really check how our system is operating before we do a deployment, before we do a certain change, <coughs> at knowing what is normal. Because we often only look at all the graphs, all the dashboards when the stuff is going wrong. Uh, take this example. Uh, you notice that something is wrong, so you start looking at this graph. But we don't know what the normal is. And we humans are really good at seeing patterns and seeing changes in our pattern, right? So looking at this graph, well, I think I know where the problem is, right? It's probably here. That's, that's how our human mind works. We just look at a pattern, but there might not even be a pattern, right? Um, looking at only this data doesn't give you, uh, doesn't have to be enough data to actually uh, draw your conclusions. Because this is uh, only the data from today. Let's plot all the data from last week on it. Hmm. Well, I think the conclusion that the spike was uh, before 12 was uh, the problem. Um, since today, we actually see different behavior, which is currently here. So uh, when you only look at stuff when it goes wrong, it's really hard to see these patterns um, when you don't know what the normal state is. So I think as developers, we should really focus on what is normal. And to help you with what is normal, we have to go into SLIs, SLOs, and SLAs. Um, I quickly explain what the differences are, right? We have service level indicators, service level objectives, and service level agreements. Um, service level indicators are actually m uh, quantitative measurements of how your service is doing, right? So the actual measures that check your availability, check your error rate, check the duration, those kind of things, right? Actual checks from how your application is doing. Serval service level objectives is a target of a combination of these SLIs together. So for example, we want to say, well, our objective is to keep the availability of our application at 99.9% .9 for all the requests over the last 30 days. Uh, this is an objective, and you can work towards this objective as a team. Lastly, we have service level agreement, which is, has nothing to do with software. It's basically a contract for your salespeople. Um, at looking at your service level objective and how are you actually doing towards this objective. So uh, what happens when you are not um, uh, fulfilling your service level objective? What are the consequences? So um, it might be that you have to pay a fine or you get some uh, your customers get discount those kinds of things so how do we define this as a team um, it starts with defining a service level objective you your product owner and everyone involved in this application you want to create a service level objective and then build in in your application the indicators that actually start measuring these things towards the objective I create a dashboard that you can see every day on how your application is actually doing. And then when you know how your application is doing all the time, you can make decisions based on that objective, right? If we're at a lot higher uh, percentage of availability compared to what our objective is, maybe we might want to do some more experiments. Uh, we might be a bit riskier because we have some room to do these experiments. When we're far below our objective, we might stop building new features and might work on actually making our application more resilient. And then leave the SLA part to your salespeople because that's not really important to us developers. And then when you have these objectives, really make them visible. So create a dashboard somewhere for everyone in the team to see how you're actually doing at this moment. And when you make it visible, try to make it as specific as possible, right? So it might be that the the full availability of all the requests together is 99.995 uh, something percent. Um, when we deploy in multiple rings, we want you might want to see what's the availabil availability per ring. Uh, maybe ring zero has uh, 
98% availability. But, well, that's not that important because, well, they have a, um, a lower SLA because uh, we, um, uh, we experiment a bit more in there. Um, we could split it up even more into actual parts of your application, right? Some, some areas of your applications are less important compared to others. But it gives you a really good insight of what is working in my application and what's not. And when you're splitting up and you're building a software as a service solution, for example, you might want to even split it up into your different clients. How are all my clients doing? How are all the different areas of um, the application doing for each client? And uh, if you have the overall availability that's still 99 something percent, when client A, the search is only 90%, they might still be quite pissed, right? So having this granularity is really important. So with that, I would like to wrap up and take a look at some uh, key takeaways. Um, when you want to instrument your code, start small, but start at key areas of your application, right? Take the areas of the application that, it's, that is the least stable. Take the area of your application that's used the most, that has the most usage, the most impact when stuff goes wrong. Because if you implement it in an area that doesn't uh, yeah, have any impact when stuff goes wrong, what's the value of all the effort that you took in instrumenting your code? Next one is just have a look at all the tools that are out there. Start experimenting with the tools you already have. Hey, you might have already have some some tools to, lo to do logging, metrics, those kinds of things. Um, try to see if they are fit for you or try to experiment with other tools. Um, embrace testing on production. You're doing it one way or the other, um, or your end users are doing it. So just embrace that you're doing testing on production. Focus on the value for your customers, right? The customers are why we build our software. We're not building it for ourselves. We're not building it um, to create a cool system. In the end, it's the users um, using our system that bring the actual value. And lastly, as development teams fully take ownership of the code and uh, bring that uh, application home from, from start to finish. Um, with that, I would like to finish up and say tonight we test and prod. Thank you. I would like to add, we have some, I have some stickers from our company, we, uh, like this. Um, our company has a motto called Do Epic Shit. We like to do epic shit for our customers. So we created this sticker for your laptop. There's a bunch of them here at the, at the ground. You can take one if you put a green card in the, in the box. And uh, well, thanks for coming.